Hey there, welcome to another exciting episode of On Guitars. I'm David Starr, and I'm at my store, Stars Guitars, in Cedar Edge, Colorado. But you probably knew that. Thanks for checking us out. Um, today I want to talk about an old Martin guitar that I've uh, had for several years. Um, I don't know a great deal about this particular instrument, you know, in terms of its history. Um, but I do know a little bit about uh, about the history of Martin guitars. Um, Martin's been around since 1833, and uh, one of the things that uh, makes them so extraordinary in uh, the vintage guitar world um, is their consistency and their longevity, and the fact that since a long, long time ago, their serial numbers are easy to figure out. Um, so this is a 1961 model, and I got this over in uh, in the Denver area in Arvada from my friend Kit at the Arvada Pickin' Parlor. I was over there several years ago, and uh, even though I was a Martin dealer here in the store at that time and had been since 1998 or so, um, I didn't... There wasn't anything in the, in the Martin line that was brand new that kind of spoke to me as something I'd want to have uh, long term, even though they make great guitars. Um, still do, always have. But this particular one, um, I pulled it down and started playing it, and I thought, yeah, this might be a good one to have for the, uh, for the personal stash. And, uh, you know, it makes, it kind of makes me wonder where it's been because it's, Got a fair bit of repair on it. Um, see some well, what you can see and what you can't, but cracks that have been fixed. Um, people come in all the time and they say, I've got a crack in my guitar. Can I refinish the guitar? That isn't going to fix the crack. You go inside and you do what's called cleating from the back, where you put some, uh, glue some little pieces of wood across the grain to keep it from getting worse and going anywhere. So that's been done on this guitar. Um, does that devalue the guitar a little bit that it's been damaged and repaired? Sure. If it was in perfect shape out of Grandma's closet, uh, it'd be worth quite a bit more money probably. But as things stand, it's a great sounding guitar and it plays well. Um, and and really, this this guitar is sort of the what I would call not a prototype, but sort of an inspiration for the the Martins that came later. Uh, you know, in the last 20 years that they called the Vintage Series, or the V. You'd see a Martin with a D28V, which meant it, it, meant it was built to, to sort of approximate vintage standards. One of the things that you can tell, and of course can't tell in the video, this has got actually got sort of a V profile on the neck. Ah, there's somebody calling. They're going to have to keep calling. We're busy. Um... This particular instrument doesn't have a real radical V, but that was very common in old guitars that they'd have a V neck because your hand sort of naturally conforms to that. Um, some folks like it, some don't. I've got a couple of old guitars that have that neck profile. It takes a little getting used to. Capos don't fit quite the same, but by and large, it's a, it's a great guitar. This one uh, has probably been oversprayed, and by that I mean somebody's shot some lacquer on it to kind of shine it up and make it new again. But it's always interesting to me to see where people pick a guitar, um, not knowing its story so much. Um, if you were watching the other day, I was talking about a Larave guitar that I had built. Uh, whether you've seen that one or not, I don't know. I think it was one of the first episodes I um, recorded. But my pattern of picking was all down here. Um, I believe that was the guitar I was talking about. So I'm playing way down there with very broad strokes. Clearly somebody did a little of that here. But really, this is what interests me, interests me is somebody played up there. So they were really chopping at that thing. Um, you know, the most legendary of old guitars with respect to the uh, damage done is Neil's old Martin named Trigger. It's an old gut string guitar that's got a big hole in it. And uh, I'm sure over the years they've spent a lot of time and money trying to keep that thing from falling completely apart. Um, but it's a cool instrument. Probably wind up in a museum someday. 
And God bless him for playing that old guitar and keeping it going. And nobody plays like he does, that's for sure. Um, this one's got a lot of finish checking. You know, we've talked about finish checking as a, it's called weather checking sometimes. And could be, could be uh, due to real weather issues. Could be just a function of the stuff getting old and getting, getting gnarly. But again, someone's played here, here, and here. So I'm going to, I'm going to, my supposition is this different person from here to here. So one owner played it up here a lot. Another one played it down here. Don't know that. Just guessing. But uh, it's always interesting to me because people bring in used guitars and uh, you can kind of get a sense of what was going on with them. Uh, sometimes somebody will bring in a guitar like this from 50s or 60s and say, when do I need to change the strings? And often we look at it and go, yesterday, um, because people don't change them often enough sometimes. And uh, um, we, we, we try to encourage. You're going to get the most out of your guitar, easier on your hands, keeps the crud off your neck and all that. So um, details on this guitar. The, the, the Dreadnought style, this big-bodied, what you've come to think of as the big Western, you know, the Western guitar, or, or, or just when people say, oh, it's just a usual acoustic guitar, well, this is often what they're talking about. The Dreadnought came along in the early 30s, um, again, and I've discussed this before, to compete with um, big bands and, and larger ensembles where you might have horns, you might have strings, you might have percussion, you know, a drummer or whatever, and the guitars couldn't compete, so they got bigger. Uh, the jumbos, the OM, the orchestra model, which is smaller than this, came along for the same reasons. Um, so oftentimes we think of design as being a function of just somebody had an idea, but it's oftentimes a function of necessity where somebody said, the only way to make this thing louder is to make it bigger. So they did, and they called it the dreadnought because it was bigger like the battleships uh, that were called dreadnoughts. So that's history in a nutshell. Spruce top, I believe this one is, uh, I don't know whether this Sitka or Adirondack, it looks like Sitka spruce to me. Uh, Adirondack is the other uh, commonly used spruce. Don't know for sure. Uh, somebody smarter than me probably would. It is, however, um, Brazilian rosewood. Um, the Brazilian rosewood was used a lot up until the uh, Endangered Species Act came into being and now it's used some uh, but is a much higher priced wood as a result of that Endangered Species Act um, what was happening was they were burning down all the and cutting down all the Amazon uh, rosewood and uh, it became endangered and just like a lot of a lot of things uh, was put on the endangered species list therefore a couple of things if I wanted to ship this guitar to the UK or the EU or to Australia huge paper trail I've got to I've got to produce about this guitar when it was built all that sort of stuff so it's complicated um, guitars moving across international borders um, one of the reasons I don't sell guitars overseas anymore, that and the Lacey Act, which is another um, more recent piece of legislation that has to do with um, tone woods and shipping and uh, international shipping, all that stuff is sort of combined to make it a, a tougher proposition for some people. So a lot of people still do it. I don't do it. I don't have the, I don't have the energy for it. A real nice marquetry on the back. Again, these, these guitars were works of art. And uh, like I say, this particular one is Brazilian rosewood book matched. You know, the two pieces of wood come together. Really, really a pretty, pretty piece of wood. Um, sides are the same way, evenly matched. So again, I don't have a, a ton of history on this one except that it has been played. And um, there are people who collect guitars who strictly want mint condition or, or primo condition guitars. I'm not one of those people. I think if it sounds really good, plays good, doesn't have a lot of structural issues, um, 
it's a, it's a candidate for me. I don't know if this one's ever had a neck reset or not. I don't think so, but I don't know that for sure. It's hard to say. Usually you can tell. It may have had. There's a little evidence of glue there, but not uncommon. Another thing that's uh, an issue with Martin guitars prior to the early 70s, 74, I think, they didn't have truss rods in the neck. Truss rod's a big rod that goes up there, you know, that you adjust the, the you know, the, 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 you adjust the neck, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, whether it has relief in it, that's the word I was looking for. Couldn't get any relief. Um, this one is in great shape, does not have any issues. I bought it really because I'd never had an old Martin that I loved that was my own. I'd had some through my store. Um, Martin made a lot of new guitars that I sold in the store. But it was one that I wanted an old Martin, but I didn't want to go all the way back and deal with one that might have structural things that needed to be done, like a neck reset or like cracks that needed repair. This had all that stuff done. So that's the deal on this guy. Um, flat picker, uh, very commonly used in bluegrass, country music, uh, this and the D18, really, really commonly used in country music and bluegrass artists. Uh, when you're growing up, if you're a guitar person, you want a Martin. You're not going to be happy till you get you a nice old Martin. That's what this is. I've got others. I'll talk about them in other episodes. Thanks for tuning in.